Oh, so this video should help you get a better grasp of Manifest Destiny, which is the topic of the DBQ that you need to write over the break. So actually, I don't know why this just started in the middle. Give me just a second. Okay, so uh, Manifest Destiny. Um, it's important for us to realize that there are a lot of things that are taking place sort of behind uh, the scenes that are contributing not only to Manifest Destiny, but just to really dramatic changes in the social patterns of the United States. The economy is becoming more complex. Um, the diversity of the population is increasing. And uh, so, you know, some of these new patterns, in addition to just basic things like abolition, are really contributing to sort of the antebellum sentiment. So uh, some of these we've already discussed, but they're worth mentioning very briefly again. So number one, it says uh, new intellectual and religious movements. Um, so don't forget what some of these are, okay? Um, in the Second Great Awakening, for example, we talked about that in a previous chapter, but this, this idea is still in play, right? Realize that um, the spread of evangelical Christianity is, uh, is incredibly popular in the early to mid-19th century. It tends actually to attract people who are less fortunate economically. So um, there are a lot of slaves that uh, become very fervent uh, in their religion. You also actually have a lot of Native Americans who uh, are sort of caught up in this movement. Other groups, women, um, sort of rural yeoman farmers, um, they tend to be much more sort of swept up by the Second Great Awakening. And then as far as other intellectual movements, um, don't forget that this is the era of the transcendentalist movement. So people like Emerson and Thoreau, who are sort of trying to get back in touch with their natural roots. Interestingly, the transcendentalist movement overlaps considerably with the anti-slavery movement. And while the two may seem very different on the outside, if you consider sort of the introspective kind of questioning of the establishment that you have in the transcendentalist movement, that same kind of questioning applies to questioning the institutions of slavery. And so this idea of kind of simplifying one's life, getting rid of unnecessary possessions, actually lends itself quite well to the anti-slavery sentiment. <clears throat> Social reforms. Uh, we actually covered quite a bit of these in uh, chapter 13, which we just talked about before we left on break. So, you know, don't forget that this is uh, the era when uh, movements like temperance are starting to kick in, the women's suffrage movement, of course. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, of course, the abolition movement. This is also the dawning of some of the earliest labor unions. And um, so these also are really getting people to kind of question, um, again, the established government, the established social hierarchies that are in place. And it, um, it kind of, uh, these sorts of challenges are uh, in a lot of ways sort of lending themselves to a more revolutionary sentiment potentially. Um, and it, to a certain extent, it makes some people, um, makes some people support an interesting, I guess, perspective going into the Civil War. Um, so one thing I was thinking about as an interesting example is you have some minorities uh, who tend to be persecuted, like Irish Catholics, for example, who tend to live in great numbers in northern cities before the Civil War. And a lot of them, interestingly, even though they are northern, uh, even though they're immigrants, a lot of them actually take a fairly racist position going into the Civil War because they don't want to fight a war that they are presuming is for slaves, right? And they feel like they are just as uh, badly off uh, financially. So some of those social reforms are not necessarily all positive, I guess one could say. Um, we talked about this in chapter 12, industrialization, right? And uh, this is very much also fueling into the antebellum sentiment, especially because the North is developing at such a rapid rate when compared to the South. So if anything, this is going to make the two sides so different, and it's going to make the North increasingly kind of feel that the South is backward economically, and that really contributes, again, to their rivalry. Um, we know that in the early years of the 19th century, there was a period where there really weren't two political parties, so that was the era of good feelings, just as a, as a review, right? But by the time we get to the 1830s and 40s, we definitely have two very distinct political parties, and they're going to get more complex going into the 1850s. But by the time we're starting around the 1830s or so, we have, of course, the Jacksonian Democrats on one side, and then the emerging Whig Party on the other. And even though the Whig Party is struggling to find its own identity, just the fact that you see these two very distinct political parties 
One, emerging actually as a complete opposition party to the current president, shows us how divided and polarized the country is becoming. And number five refers to some of the early 19th century Supreme Court decisions, things like Marbury versus Madison, of course, which establishes judicial review. Also, don't forget decisions like Gibbons versus Ogden, um, McCulloch versus Maryland, um, Dartmouth College versus Woodward. These are some notable ones. And while if you forget the actual ruling for these cases, just remember that the vast majority of Supreme Court decisions in the early 19th century are all strengthening the federal government and uh, weakening the states in turn. And this also has the ability to make the Supreme Court stronger um, because they keep really answering this key question um, that has a sectional divide, right? How should we govern, through the federal government or through the states? If the Supreme Court keeps taking the side of the federal government, clearly uh, the people in the country who support strong states' rights are going to sort of feel like they, uh, they're getting the short end of the stick, for lack of a better phrase. Um, so what is Manifest Destiny? So um, it's actually, it was a term that was coined by a newspaper ed editor named John O'Sullivan in 1845. But Manifest Destiny as an idea was around before it really had a name. And uh, I'll just give you an opportunity to look at this quote here, right? The right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent, which providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and, oops, sorry, that's federal development of self-government entrusted to us. It is a right such as that of the, of the tree to the space of air and the earth suitable for the full expansion of its principle and destiny of growth. Okay, so while we don't have to analyze this entire passage right here to make sense of it, I want you to pay attention to the word providence here in particular, because there really is a religious undertone to Manifest Destiny. Um, the, it's really the idea that white Christian males have the ability to, uh, to spread wet, even if this territory is not yet part of the United States. Um, really, the, the best way to define Manifest Destiny is just this notion that Americans have a God-given right to expand across the continent and to conquer any obstacles that sort of uh, come in their way. So really, the biggest obstacle we're talking about are Native Americans, but also, eventually, we'll talk about the Mexicans. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of the best sort of artistic representations of Manifest Destiny is in this painting here. So again, it's a little late. It's sort of a reflection upon an era that has already passed. Um, but yeah, American Progress by John Gast. And um, you know, many people sort of see this figure in the center as an angel or sort of the, um, I guess, the metaphorical representation of manifest destiny. Notice that she is moving from right to left, presumably from the East Coast to the West Coast. Notice that the areas that she has already passed are lit up. And notice that there are clear signs of industrialization on this side, right? Ships, trains, covered wagons, plowed fields. And then notice on the other side that everything is dark and you see these uh, groups like Indians, buffalo, and, nat and wild animals sort of leaving this area. And so the assumption, I guess, is that as progress, so to speak, or this figure here, moves from one direction to another, they get rid of the old ways, the seeming primitive ways or the darkness, and they shed light or bring industry, bring their more complex economy along with them. Clearly, this is a very biased painting in favor of Manifest Destiny, um, but it's a really good artistic representation of, of what's really happening here. So um, <clears throat> why would anyone support Manifest Destiny? Let's really put ourselves in the time period and, and understand why people would find this to be a good thing. Um, one of the major uh, perks to manifest destiny would be economic in nature, right? So the more land you have, clearly, the more natural resources you're going to have access to, first of all. Um, they don't even realize at the dawning of this ideology that there are some pretty substantial gold deposits in the California region, um, but they will determine that. This is also a primetime mining territory. Um, there also are many areas that have very arable land. Eventually, when we get more into the cattle and grazing industry, we're going to see a lot of that. those plains regions are really perfect for, um, for sort of the ranging 
uh, ranger rather industry that's going to really start to pop up in earnest in the mid to late 19th century. And then also, once you expand all the way to another coast, to the Pacific, you have access to more trade networks. And so we're going to see towards the end of the 19th century that the U.S. is really opening up the possibility to trade with Asia as well. Um, one of the problems that we see, though, is how it divides the country politically. So just so that we get this right out of the way, for the most part, Democrats are the party that really support Manifest Destiny. Okay, Democrats tend to be pro-slavery. Um, they tend to support uh, the rights of the states over the rights of the federal government. One of the best examples of a Manifest Destiny Democrat is the 11th president of the U.S., James Polk, right here. So when he ran for president in 1846, or my apologies, 1844, um, he actually ran on a Manifest Destiny platform. He basically promised the people that if they voted for him, that he would keep adding uh, territory onto the United States, which he did. Um, the Whigs, remember, they're the opposition party to Andrew Jackson. The Whigs really don't like the idea of Manifest Destiny. First off, more Whigs are anti-slavery than Democrats. And so the real question is, if we expand West, then does slavery expand along with it, right? And uh, Whigs don't like that. Um, they also really fear that adding more states onto the Union is going to sort of water down the strength of their region. Um, there are more Whigs that live in um, in sort of the more manufactured uh New England in mid-Atlantic type states, and they're worried that if Western territory keeps getting tacked on, that that's going to water down uh, the kind of strength that they have in the government. Um, before we get to some of the uh, major focuses of Manifest Destiny, and I'm really talking about the Southwest, let's think about maybe the uh, less familiar areas that do apply as far as Manifest Destiny is concerned. So believe it or not, we can apply it to the East, and one example of that would be Maine. Um, realize that at this point there are still disputes over the true border between uh, the United States and Canada in this northeast region. And so you see this area here, this area that is in green, was actually um, in dispute actually between lumberjacks in both uh, Canada and Maine along the R. Stuck River here. So uh, this actually, um, going into 1842 when there was a settlement, there actually was a brief uh, conflict, sort of a skirmish, almost a war between Maine and Canada um, called the Arstook War, but it's really not a formal war. It wasn't declared by Congress. Um, but anyway, when that conflict ends, uh, the United States enters into a treaty with uh, Canada called the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, and that's in 1842. And all that does is this draws the formal border between Maine and Canada. And so um, what we see here, remember that Canada is a part of uh, Great Britain still at this point. Um, this is more a uh, sort of French-influenced area of Canada, but at the same time, this is really interesting because this is not the only example of the United States conflicting with Britain over territory. So in a way, it's almost like the earliest stages of imperialism, um, or at the very least, kind of this uh, scramble for land, because more land equals a stronger economy, equals more political power. And both Britain and the United States are aware of that, even if they're not quite sure what to do with that territory. All right. So another area, um, probably more important than Maine, not to be biased, but uh, is the Oregon Territory, so the Northwest Territory of the United States. All right, so at this point, Oregon actually is way larger than our present-day border of Oregon, which we know now is actually partially Washington State, as you know, if you kind of can read this map and notice where we are geographically. Okay, so going into the 1840s, Oregon was actually jointly ruled by... Um, by Britain and the United States. Um, so what's going to happen is there are going to be increased disputes about who really should control this region, Britain or the United States, obviously. Um, when Polk runs for president in 1844, again, like I mentioned earlier, he's a manifest destiny candidate, right? He promises that he will add territory to the U.S. if people vote for him. And so he starts to really call out uh, Great Britain about this disputed land, and he basically threatens to go to war with Britain if they don't negotiate a, um, a border and negotiate a border that's uh, going to give the United States some substantial land. So, uh, so there's actually like a little saying uh, that Polk was sort of uh, known to encourage, and that was uh, 54-40 or fight, 
What this means is basically this is the border, the latitudinal border, 5440 right here, right? And the idea is that James Polk threatened to go to war with Britain unless they got this border here, this latitudinal line. And so even though they don't go to war, um, this is interesting because you see that Polk is a really aggressive president who will try to negotiate a treaty first, but if he doesn't get his way, he's more than willing to fight. And so even though the U.S. does not go to war with Britain, the U.S. is going to go to war with Mexico pretty soon. So it kind of shows us that even though Polk does a treaty here, he's not bluffing when he says he's going to go to war with someone. <clears throat> and so the joint uh, British and U.S. occupation of Oregon ends when this border is settled in 1846. And then uh, uh, later in 1859, Oregon officially becomes a state. All right, so we'll get to the statehood later. All right, Texas is one of the most significant examples of Manifest Destiny, and it also, the acquisition of Texas and then later the U.S. war with Mexico really heightens the tension between North and South. Um, it really raises the question about the future of slavery. Um, so a lot of people argue that the Mexican-American War was just yet one more step on the course to civil war. All right, so... Um, before Texas actually becomes annexed into a state, it has a brief period of independence where it's no longer part of Mexico, but it's not yet quite, uh, part of the United States. So this is very interesting here. So Mexico became independent in the early 1820s from Spain. And uh, once it does that, it has um, this policy where it actually encourages Americans to come and trade along the Santa Fe Trail. Um, so essentially... Um, you have these American settlers who are coming from other south, southern territories, Arkansas, uh, New Orleans, for example, and they're going into these areas to try to trade, right? And Mexico also wants to develop its economy in this area. So what you're going to find is that they're actually going to be American traders, American trappers, American farmers, who are going to start to move into Texas, and they're actually going to settle there. And the Mexican government actually encouraged that at first. Uh, the land was cheap for the Americans, and, um, and it helped populate these regions. Um, and so, you know, in the early years, one could say that this was an interesting experiment. Um, first off, you found that a lot of these settlements were really multi-ethnic in nature. Um, so you had, uh, you had whites living in the same place. You had Tejanos, which were, um, they were sort of native Texans who uh, ethnically were a mix of Spanish and Native American. Um, so this sort of diversity at the early stages of Texas was quite interesting. Um, but one of the problems was sort of the mission um, or the disagreement about how Texas would be run socially. So um, a lot of Americans who end up going into Texas kind of feel like politically, economically, socially, it's the exact same as the United States. Um, and so the people who are coming from places like Mississippi and Louisiana are bringing their slaves with them. And that's problematic because Mexico actually outlawed slavery in 1828. Right? So because of that, there's going to be this clash between Mexico and these American settlers about bringing slaves in. All right? So basically, it's violating um, Mexico's constitution if American slave owners are coming into their territory and bringing their slaves. These people, by the way, who are coming in to settle in Texas are called empresarios. Okay? So they're sort of like entrepreneurs. Um, they recruit people to move to Texas, they buy land and sell it to make a profit, and again, many of them are slave, slave owners. So because they're bringing their slaves, it aggravates Mexi Mexican, uh, the Mexican president, Santa Ana, and uh, in 1835, they actually go to war with the United, um, they go to war with the United States, right? But the, Sorry, I digress, or not I digress, I want to backtrack there. Texas goes to war with Mexico, not the United States, okay? Um, anyway, the Americans do help out in the conflict over Texas, um, and uh, the people who support uh, the independence of Texas, or the people that support helping Texas, tend to be those who want to preserve a slaveholding culture, and also people who want to make Texas another state in the Union. All right, so this war is relatively short-lived, and one of the most monumental events of this uh, Texas War for Independence was the defeat at the Alamo. So at the end of this conflict, this is in 1836, um, 
the uh, the Mexican army led by the president Santa Ana ends up uh, storming this uh, this military fort and at the Alamo in Texas, and they actually kill every single American that's there. Um, so the Alamo is actually a very devastating event for Americans. But what follows it is the end of the war. So Sam Houston, who we just saw, at least I think we did. Sam Houston here on the left actually after the Alamo and the phrases remember the Alamo because it was seen almost as an effort for revenge um, Sam Houston ends up um, defeating the Mexican president Santa Ana at a battle called San Jacinto which is right after the Alamo and with that defeat Texas becomes independent so that happens in 1836 and then in 1845 Texas gets annexed and becomes a state all right, but here's some of the problems or some of the lingering questions that we need to answer if Texas is going to become a state. So the biggest question is what's going to happen to slavery, right? Is Texas going to admit slaves? Um, is it going to uh, is it going to sort of off balance because it's such a large state? Um, the proportion of free states and slave states, right? There's there's a lot of unanswered questions about the future of slavery in the West, and Texas just really keeps that question wide open. Also, what you're finding is now that this is an, uh, an American area, which, uh, which is going to increasingly get flooded by American settlers, you're going to have more and more conflict between Anglo speakers, so white people, and Tejanos, the people who lived there before. Um, so this shows us, uh, you know, again, kind of a good representation of Manifest Destiny because the Americans that come there are uh, immediately trying to kind of encroach upon the land of people that lived there previously. Um, in 1844, James Polk is going to get elected, and like I was saying earlier, he is literally elected on this platform of Manifest Destiny. So, um, so basically, uh, since he was elected the year before Texas became a state, this is one of his big promises to the country, right? I will add Texas as a state. It will no longer be an independent republic. So this was something that was really controversial um, between the Americans, people, Whigs in particular, really did not want to add Texas to the Union, but people like Polk very much did. And another unanswered question that we have is what the true border between Me uh, Mexico and Texas is. And that's a border dispute that will be settled uh, during the Mexican-American War. But going back to westward expansion briefly, <clears throat> realize that um, this is between 1840 and 1860, uh, the amount of migration from east to west is uh, growing rapidly. Um, just in these 20 years, uh, between 250 and 300,000 people actually move westward in search of better jobs, in search of cheap land, in search of even things like precious minerals, gold. Um, but they were not nearly as aware of the presence of gold in the early 1840s um, as they were after the gold rush begins in 1949. So the Overland Trail is probably the most famous of all these trails. So it connects uh, essentially the Chicago area all the way to San Francisco. Um, so it's a 2,000 mile long trail. It's very expensive and hazardous to go through it. Um, you need to really save for years if you want to bring your family on this trail. And there's no guarantee that everyone is going to survive, no guarantee that you won't get raided, no guarantee that, um, that you're going to have enough supplies to get to the end. Um, the Plains trip um, was relatively simple. So when you were going through states like Kansas and Nebraska, there, were not, there was not really rugged terrain. But once you reached places like Denver, Utah, you were actually climbing the Rocky Mountains. So it was incredibly difficult. Um, so pioneers often battled disease, lack of food, and Indian attacks. Um, but there were many people that were still attracted to migrating west on these trails. Many of them, not surprisingly, were single men. Um, they were seen as pioneers, right? They saw this as an economic opportunity, not without risk. But for them, the risk was also sort of an adventure, right? And uh, many people saw this as a prospect to build a new home um, and also to maybe escape um, an economic or, you know, um, some sort of failure that they experienced when they tried to settle in the East. Um, so in any case, this westward migration is really significant, and once the gold rush starts in 1849, it's only going to grow from there. And this is just a nice uh, artistic representation of this sort of hope and, um, and the, I guess, the the almost enlightenment that the Oregon Trail was supposed to bring people who sort of dreamt about that destination in Oregon and California. Here are some other trails 
Um, one of the really interesting ones uh, that we could talk about briefly um, was the Dahmer Party. Um, so they are uh, an example of what can really go wrong on one of these journeys. So the Dahmer Party, actually, they faced a really early winter and got stuck in the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains, so in between the border of Nevada and California. Their ultimate destination was California, but only 48 of the people who left on this party actually survived. Um, and the people who did get stuck, um, and now it's called Lake Dahmer, by the way, but the people that got stuck and retreated on the Sierra Nevada mountains, many of them actually resorted to cannibalism to survive. Um, so that really gives you a sense of how desperate the situation was. I'm going to stop this and we'll continue on with a part two. So this is really the introduction to the Mexican-American War and such, all the other instances of Manifest Destiny, and the Mexican-American War I'll treat as a separate discussion. All right, so stay tuned for that.